Uh, good morning, everyone. Just about. Um, so I'm, I'm presenting this on behalf of uh, Great Broad Consortium, the people that sits uh, within the Marine Research Plymouth Initiative. Uh, that's a collection of um, academic institutes, including uh, my own labs at Plymouth Marine Laboratory, uh, Marine Biological Association, and the University of Plymouth, and many partners. I'll come on to mention quite a few in a moment. Um, and as a fairly new recruit to PML, uh, this is very much uh, in this work that I present. So the National Centre for Coastal Autonomy was launched just the end of 22. The idea really behind the concept is to try and bring together a number of different initiatives that have been developed over the years that are particularly focused on uh, coast, uh, coastal oceanographic uh, research. Uh, so each of, each of the institutes here has a particular focus on uh, uh, our coastal oceans, so obviously, um, much, as, well as, as well as researching much um, in, over deep ocean. What we were recognising, though, particularly within the development of marine autonomous systems is that a lot of those systems tended to be uh, focused on those, on those deep water and polar applications. We felt that there was a, a real need to start providing um, a hub, if you like, or, and, and starting to develop and work towards the centre of excellence that had a little bit more of a coastal ocean focus. Some of the obvious uh, reasons there being the, the greater interactivity between terrestrial and ocean systems, closer to, closer to land, also the hazards that we have, um, typically have to deal with, rocky shorelines, shallow water, fast and, uh, and strong time type of currents. And if we look back at the incentives for us, um, we go back to our, um, our traditional uh, ways of doing things, and this is certainly still very much in use today. This is the uh, Quest. This is PMO's uh, small research vessel uh, that's used to uh, maintain Western Channel Observatory, um, which is a, a sustained observing system just off of uh, Plymouth, uh, in, in the waters off Plymouth. And that's actually been in existence in some form since 1903. It's one of the longest uh, running time series uh, we have available uh, to us for ocean, uh, ocean observation. And that's typically made of a whole, a whole host of different observational capabilities. Um, the oceanographers or those that are uh, involved here in marine science will recognise things like the CTDs, but you know, very traditional methods of net hauls, actually dragging things out of the ocean, taking them back to the lab, making those measurements. And if we look at the myriad of different uh, disciplines that we have within that, and I'm sure there's lots of things that sit between these in, in the right areas as well here. You know, this, these become very complex uh, projects with a whole host of different uh, uh, data pipelines and potential for digital technologies to play a real, really uh, important role in terms of advancing our science capability. I'm going to focus a little bit more on some of the platforms uh, today. There's a talk tomorrow by my colleague, uh, Tom Mansfield, who will be digging into uh, some of the data pipeline um, uh, side of the So, um, where, where, can, where, can the late, you know, where can the digital technologies and the marine autonomous technologies start assisting us uh, in, in these sort of areas? And the hope here is that by bringing together that collective capability under that um, NCCA plan, that we can start making uh, some progress and, and, a, and a, like I say, a focus, a focus for people to gather around. Uh, over the last few years, we've already been um, trying to bring together some of that, some of the hardware, the shiny yellow robots, as I often refer to them, uh, under the Smart Sound Plymouth Initiative. Again, similar collaboration here, but also including uh, Plymouth City Council and the University of Exeter. And this uh, it presents some of the types of technologies that we're talking about. It's a slightly broader perspective, maybe, than some of, um, some of the other um, uh, marine autonomous systems hubs might typically deal with. We're becoming quite familiar with seeing these shiny yellow robots like the gliders and the AUVs. We've, I think we've all passed them coming through the door, uh, the boat, boat face uh, model down there and the gliders that I've personally been working with for a long time. Uh, but we're also starting to get ever more intelligent smart boy systems um, with autonomous capabilities, with, uh, particularly around the sort of high, um, high density uh, transfer of information from communications networks that we can provide. Uh, uncruised surface vehicles that are a really interesting area uh, for research, the potential they have, but also the, the problems we're starting to experience around regulation um, of those type of platforms. The MCA start to prevent some of that development um, because the, essentially the regulation isn't managing to keep up with the technologies and science that we're trying to do. And then some of these uh, autonomous things that are a little bit more recognisable as, 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 as boats that we might otherwise see in the shore. Um, post environment, but also these can be these are starting to be scaled up, and of course, a very a, a lot of interest from the industry mm -hmm. in terms of what future shipping might be um, with the role of autonomy and um, and AI. So the objective here of the NCCA uh, is to provide a fully integrated uh, marine monitoring framework. 
enabling a platform for uh, multi vehicle surveys uh, to establish and uh, establishing monitoring capabilities, but also to provide the underpinning of state of the art communication networks that can help these things happen. Uh, a key part of what we're working on, and more relevant maybe to a lot of people in this audience, is around starting to develop those um, uh, data and image, image libraries that have the potential for the use and apologies for the typos there, but, uh, for training for various uh, AI solutions. I'll come on to say a little bit more about that in a moment. Various other uh, different applications that embrace the uh, sort of expertise within, within the groups. And I think a key part of this really is bringing together those regional, national and international partnerships that the NCCA can provide. In terms of access, uh, the, for me, I think um, what I'd really like to see uh, coming from trying to advertise this, uh, this new initiative to, to audience like, like this is that we provide a platform for innovation and also training. And it, again, in order to actually develop this level of capability, and obviously we're, we're sat also in Baton with the massive amount of infrastructure that they maintain for community access and use. You know, again, providing that in a, um, a UK coastal waters environment so with the uh, collective capability across the partnership uh, such as the uh, marine center here from the university this is a, uh, one of our uh, workshops here just preparing this this is one of our smart um, uh, smart voice systems that's now just going to back into the water but all the way down to some of the sort of more traditional capabilities and crews you know never underestimating the amount of expertise and skills that, that are required to actually get things get things wet uh, and again, that, so that's um, so that's available to academic and industry and, and basically uh, any partner that wants to come have a chat. Um, more recently, we've also been developing the um, uh, communications networks. So we have a uh, fully capable now 4G and 5G uh, uh, communications system within the Plymouth Sound uh, area. If you're, if you're familiar with that part of the UK, so here's Plymouth here, and we've got this large sound area. Um, with, uh, with it, with it. Uh, but, uh, there's a breakwater just there if anyone's familiar with that. Uh, so this is going to be on that to so, uh, around the 20, uh, 20 nautical miles level of connectivity. Um, that's one to get from that. And uh, the, uh, there's capability there also to work within sort of uh, remote communication systems. So again, bringing along your own your own equipment to test within that system, bringing together your own uh, comms networks can, can be fairly rapidly uh, link, link into that to provide uh, sort of mobile capability to extend um, and take advantage of that system. And uh, in the very near future, we're hoping September this year, we'll extend that into a submarine um, sort of subsurface communications network. So the equipment's um, coming in over this summer, and the hope is that we'll have these transponder networks going in to allow for communications and navigation systems within that. Um, that uh, smart smart sound area, but again, this this is a uh, this is a mobile system potentially that can be applied in, in other areas. But we're going to uh, provide focus in the first instance in the area that we uh, we already operate. And I wanted to add, I mentioned earlier about the broader network um, of, of partnerships. So within um, the LRP partnerships, we also have the Fast Cluster. It's the largest marine autonomy uh, cluster in the UK. Uh, uh, triple helix uh, cluster, as we term it, between industry, government, and academia. And you can see the vast range. I'm sure there's plenty that haven't necessarily been updated onto this slide, but there's uh, quick, quick and easy access to this large cluster by uh, through the collaboration through the NCCA. And I just wanted to come on and highlight a few of the applications that I thought might be quite uh, of interest to the, uh, to the audience and the sort of things that the uh, initiative can help. Help drive forward. So this is some work that I was I was involved with personally. Actually, before I joined PMO, I was still at the uh, NOC. Uh, and uh, just to flag, there's a, a fairly recent paper from the day before at the Met Office that summarised a lot of this work. So I can't be worth tapping into that uh, if you want more information. But I'm more than happy to later. So this featured uh, this was based upon the growth capability of these uh, submarine gliders um, uh, on the on the left there. And so this was a three month mission run in the um, in that same area just off Plymouth Sound and uh, so we had one of the, a single glider and anyone who's worked with these uh, might will understand that they're extremely slow systems you know they're, they're typically only uh, moving horizontally at about 0.2 meters per second typical tidal uh, velocities in this area would be more approaching one meter per second between a half and one meter per second so we've got a we've got a system that's not going to get anywhere very fast it also means that they're particularly susceptible to residual currents they might end up where you don't want them to be it's extremely tricky to try and manage them in the coastal environment. Again, 
part incentive behind uh, developing the NCCA. We're also, um, the ability, however, the, the interesting part of this film is that each time these, these so these um, gliders sort of profile through the oceans, they come to the surface on a, on a regular basis, communicate some information back to us, give us some data, and allow us to then communicate back to the glider. So there's a potential there for adaptive sampling capability, which, um, which was the objective of this yeah. exercise. So in this instance, the uh, gliders coming up every, I think it was about three hours we ended up, um, up at would come up and uh, forecast, uh, provide data back, that data was then being ingested with an operational forecast model run by Met Office partners, which also uh, ingests Earth observation data from satellites um, uh, to try and improve the uh, local, uh, local, local forecast capability. Uh, but we then applied also our own uh, stochastic, uh, stochastic uh, prediction model that uh, in training, uh, essentially tried to we were training that model using the past 72 hours worth of data. From both the model, the observations, to then try and improve, uh, provide a uh, some improved guidance to, to the glider, feeding back to the glider, say where it should go next. And in this in this instance, we use uh, use the objectives of finding the uh, uh, phytoplankton patches as they're developing through a spring bloom period. So that this transitional period during the spring, where uh, the ocean is getting warmer, the structure of the ocean starts to change, and that's when we get a lot of our biological production, and we see these uh, phytoplankton blooms occurring. Uh, across our coastal waters. And that's when a lot of our carbon is fixed into our oceans. Um, so it's it's, all here. And it's so it's really important to try and get these forecasts um, or these, the, uh, the modeling capability uh, as, as, as good as it can be. So I'll try and walk you through um, where we actually got with that. Where, so the, hopefully you can see a point out here. So the glider data here is this light blue, and this is the real time data coming in. So through a daily period, those, that chlorophyll is changing continually. We get small patches of phytoplankton moving around. We've got this glider that's barely being controlled in a very strongly tidal environment, and it's sort of drifting in and out of these little patches of phytoplankton. That data, we took a daily mean from that, and, that, um, and that's that blue line, the dark blue line on the top. <coughs> and if we then look at what the operational model uh, was producing, which is the green line. So this is the um, operational physical model produced by the Met Office linked to the the uh, ecosystem model uh, that we have developed, uh, or we were keen on developing it. And so the forecast for that is actually this green line at the bottom. And that's not, not a great surprise because the red crosses are the uh, satellite data uh, that are actually being ingested into the model as, it, as part of its assimilation. So the model is essentially being trained with the uh, red crosses. So it's no real surprise that it's not managing to get up to where the um, actual intelligence grid in situ observations are giving us our data. Remembering, of course, that the satellite data is only seeing that um, top meter or so of, of the water. So it's missing a lot of what's going on. The uh, stochastic model uh, was able to uh, produce a much, uh, because it was ingesting the real time data in situ data from the glider as well as the Earth observation uh, information, was actually providing much better. Um, much better uh, prediction. That's this uh, purple layer. So from this, it was then guiding glider to where it needed to actually go and measure these um, the, the patches of this phytoplankton, and it was then feeding it back to our own version of the operational model because the Met Office can't run its model twice because uh, it's too big. So we were running it offline on our own version, and the orange line there is is, is what we were we were providing as a, a sort of offline uh, alternative. And as you can see, we, we managed to constrain or bring this information but much more to uh, more realistic uh, situation. In terms of upscaling of this type of approach, though, uh, the bottom plots here show what the difference was between what we would see within the um, in that in that local forecast relative to. So it's the um, difference between the uh, model, the actual observations from the glider, and what the operational model was seeing. Uh, so we can see that we're improving that. Um, that model uh, in the immediate footprint of where we're actually observing, but in broader, uh, the broader area of that is not being improved, certainly not under the methods we use in this case. So the question actually start, we can start then building that, what an op what a, uh, optimal um, uh, monitoring framework might need to look like in order to bring the model up to, up to uh, you know, its, its optimal capability. Uh, so depending on what's going from there, and I think I might like to still squeeze another one in. So, um, this is a very different project that we're um, working on within the uh, NCCA at PML. This is the Automated In-Situ Plankton Imaging and Classification System. So this is 
trying to replicate, um, trying to improve upon the traditional methods of going out, going out, using our ship, using our um, water collection to then take back to the lab and undertake a whole series of different uh, analysis techniques to understand what the uh, phytoplank uh, the plankton community structure might look like and how it changes over time. So the uh, APEX APEX system employs two different imaging systems: the methane um, flow cytobot and the uh, plankton ana analytics uh, PI10. The reason being here that they capture slightly different parts of the side spectrum, so the uh, uh, flow cytometer, uh, flow cytobot via the beam at the smaller class, and the uh, PI10 here, and that fits very well with the type of plankton that we see in our, our system. But of course, there's, there's one thing buying the equipment, and this, it, it, the um, challenge really is getting that into the environment and making it, uh, making it of use. And that's again where the infrastructure that the NCCA provides allows us to uh, integrate this within our already existing uh, voice systems. And this, uh, the expectation is towards the end of this year, we'll start actually, once we've done, uh, finished understanding how these bits of kit work from the bench, we'll start getting these integrated within our voice systems uh, and hopefully generating data by the next year. Uh, so, th so we'll, this will provide the uh, same. Profiling capabilities, I'll put in these uh, imaging, imaging capability on profiling buoys, um, uh, integrating the two systems on, uh, in close proximity to each other, uh, and we'll have a profiling CGD frame uh, coming out of that L4 buoy in CMS. So there's a lot, a massive amount of infrastructure required to actually get these into a useful form. Um, and of course, in order to actually get to the point where we can do uh, communicate this sort of information near real time, there's a whole host of other technical challenges uh, in front of us, not least the compression of the, um, well, it's not compression, but it's the uh, communication of very large amounts of data and how uh, the trade off between onboard processing uh, of that data and then com and communication of that over what might be an extremely high um, uh, bandwidth compared to most ocean applications. But again, it's still going to be limiting. Um, in terms of how much information we can get in those type of systems. So there's a whole host of work that hasn't yet been done, but we're really keen to talk to people who are working in sort of similar um, also image um, identification and classification system. And I think we can all learn a lot from each other in that space. So I hope I haven't overrun or left it time for a question or two. Um, so to summarize, uh, the NCCA is offering uh, a fully, fully integrated marine autonomous systems network it's open access to academic industry and other partners um, with the intention here of establishing a centre of excellence for coastal ocean autonomous systems. And I won't read uh, what, what I've written there, um, but hopefully I have enough time for a question. <coughs> Thank you. Uh, another sort of breadth of the environment we're covering space and forest. What prospect? There's so many, so few examples of adaptive sampling actually seen in practice. So I think that's really interesting. What what prospect is there of this being expanded beyond the Earth and digital twin twin territory of the uh, kind of relaying that back to the Met Office? And the to be honest, we have the technology and we have the capability already. Um, the, the funding vehicle for that needs to be quite large. <laughs> it is quite quite large. Autonomous systems are often put up as uh, cheap and available, but that really, that's really a perspective taken from how much a ship might cost. Um, so it's, it's a lot cheaper than putting a ship into the water, but it doesn't do what a ship does. We don't tend to put 40 or 50 ships in the water, but the opportunity exists for 40 or 50 of, of those <laughs> robotic systems in to actually start getting that whole system monitoring capability. I, I think we need to be a little bit careful about how quickly we rush into these large systems. So running two would be an advance on one. Um, and actually running those two in a sensible way that they're actually complementing the measurements. So, so some of the thinking behind why and how we use those platforms, I think still needs to be done. Uh, so I, I'd see those as the next steps. The Plymouth application here actually was a real challenge because it's a really tricky bit of water. We actually were extremely constrained um, because particularly because of the shipping and uh, and uh, transport uh, the shipping issues, but that's quite typical of coastal environments. Again, you know the different challenges that we ex we experience in that space compared to say open ocean. But in terms of can we, we can immediately upscale this capability. Yeah, it, it, that is that capability already exists in the UK. But you have a glider of one, right? 
Is that, am I, am I, so no, that's that what I was thinking, oh, if you could adapt, do adaptive sampling and then not do adaptive sampling with another glider, would that be a way of showing it genuinely was adaptive sampling? Um, I think we can generally demonstrate where it's adaptive sampling because these things have an almost real time communication. You know, it's, it's, it's a completely circular loop for this, right? There's, there's quite a few other people working in this space as well. We are seeing people using small fleets of autonomous systems. Um, but yeah, it's lots of opportunity. Um, yes. Thank you, University. Is there a primary sort of scientific or societal problem that you can address through, through this initiative that is, let's say, focusing your attention on you know, delivering some you know, clear change from what we've been doing before? Um, but the whole, I mean, the, the, there's, a long, there's a long list of uh, scientific objectives and priorities that Western Channel Observatory and the whole coastal ocean um, uh, observational monitoring communities focused on. I think the key, the key objective here is to start trying to provide the right sort of vehicle and platform that we can start testing the technologies that we, we each need to actually feed into our, our uh, science objectives. I don't think the NCCA needs to necessarily come up with a new, whether scientific or societally important objective. I think there's plenty of them for us to choose from. I think what's lacking often is is some um, focal point to help coordinate you know what is becoming you know the amount of available platforms and technologies that are coming available to us we're all very busy who's got time to invest time and money to try and test these systems i think the ncta and the experience you know in terms of the smart sampling of opportunities and well and, and just generally the, the national capability that NERC underpins provides that platform for those different questions to be addressed i'm not sure the question needs to come from the ncta to just um, but happy to talk about any the direction you want to try and help take it. I think if we have to, we have time for one more question, and I'm going to jump in. So, on that last slide, you were talking about using image recognition for different types of uh, uh, plankton, yeah. and we had a talk through the sort of web series um, CV about the difficulty of convincing the community of the buy-in on the sort of merits <laughs> of that. What's your experience been of trying to sell that as a, actually as elevating that to an operational system? So I'm, a, I'm a absolutely not expert in that space, okay. but I'm, I'm, I'm certainly talking with the people who, who are doing that. I can give my opinion. I think there's, that's actually, it's, 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 it's an active uh, discussion that's going on in our labs at the moment. So there's, there's a whole host of different things going on in terms of the image, image uh, use, of, um, use of images, the image uh, identification, classification. There doesn't seem to be at the moment, a particularly well coordinated community trying to gather around and actually try and test, you know, share their experience, share, uh, share their expertise. Um, yeah, that, I, I agree. We were talking last night, Steve and I over, over dinner actually about what an excellent tool that was. It was fantastic. But I mean, I know the PML and CFAS aren't necessarily coordinating their efforts in that space. We're buying similar equipment. Um, there's others around the community. They're talking to each other for the science applications. I don't think. Some of the tech, more technical ends of that are being discussed quite so broadly. Um, and I think that's actually on us as a community to, to try and help take forwards. I do see a, the need for some bottom up initiatives in that space just to get us all talking to each other, understanding where there's common problems and where, where, where those problems are. I think it's really encouraging the amount of progress you've been able to make, given that there is that kind of hesitancy. Sort of there needs to be that bottom up movement first, and yet you've still been able to like, make progress with it. So that's why I take it's really, really encouraging. Just I realized that for those of you that didn't see the talk, uh, <laughs> it's really, really good and it's recorded. Um, but uh, AI methods for doing image processing uh, were almost limited by humans mm -hmm. at this point. And it's going back to the pre that first talk um, how collecting mm -hmm. training data, quality of training data is really hard to collect. It's, 